Hi, everyone. Uh, I would like you to meet Dave Hansen, president of Client Tether. Um, Dave, welcome to the call. Yeah, thanks a lot, Lance. Glad to be here with you. So, Dave, for people who uh, aren't familiar with Client Tether, can you tell us a little bit about what you guys do? Yeah, th yeah, of course. Uh, and thanks for having me, Lance. So, Client Tether is a sales automation platform that was built by franchisors for the franchising industry. Uh, we 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 are a CRM tool. Uh, most CRMs are built backwards for franchising. They don't support multi-unit. They don't. They have the wrong data structure for the contacts. You know, leads breaking into contacts accounts, opportunities, like five different data tables, complexity. Ours, our our dev mantra is: if a dumb painter can't use it, don't build it. So. The, user, the UI is simple to adopt. Uh, it has automation tools built in to engage leads rapidly across text, call, email. You can put a box of brownies in the mail for you, send handwritten notes. It's it's a pretty robust platform, um, more robust than anything I'd used in 15 years of managing sales teams in corporate America, which caught me off guard uh, when when I found when I was chatting with the founder and and he told me about the platform. So that's that's kind of, in a nutshell, Frandev. We're the fastest growing and top rated tool in franchise development for franchise brands, FSOs, consultants. And uh, we are, again, top rated uh, and, and very fast growing platform for unit level operations, which is what we were originally built for eight and a half years ago. Right, because if somebody has a CRM and follow-up engine that they've made for businesses in general, it doesn't mean that it wasn't uh, built with the actual franchise or franchisees in mind. And this was originally built, like you said, uh, for a painter, uh, this is this is built in the franchise industry by a franchisor, and mm -hmm. uh, it's designed for exactly what you would need with all those follow ups. And uh, I, I can only imagine um, the detail of being able to sift through the data and find your, you know, figure out, you know, what's going on with people who are crushing it and what's going on with people who are struggling to identify that so you can um, learn from it and also proactively go in and fix things. Right. Oh man, yeah, it's crazy because once you start to get real data in a franchise system, and this is like out of the box stuff for us, you spend you know two hundred fifty thousand dollars with a HubSpot or a Salesforce or a Zoho, you might be able to get to this point, right? But just you know, turnkey with us, you can flip, you know check a few boxes and do a comparative analysis of multiple locations and see where in the sales flow are they failing and struggling and succeeding. So it, it also the operational side of the house tend to want to operate in the platform too, because they can immediately without typically like a field ops person, they'll call a franchise owner and they'll try to interview them and figure out, Hey, what, where are you struggling? But they don't know. And the owners don't know. So they're trying to ask questions and figure out where might there be a chink in the armor. And then they're going to try to figure out how to fix it with us. They just look at the dashboard and say, Oh, he's really bad at setting appointments and converting leads into, into estimates, or he's great at that, but he stinks at closing. But most franchisors have no clue what the a lead conversion rate is by source, for example, or even where their franchisee is getting all their leads from. Uh, it, some of that data is invisible to them. Or how are they doing converting the leads we spent the ad fund to create for them? They don't know. Uh, but with us, you can, you can see it all and then make very intelligent decisions for coaching or for marketing strategy. Right. And if you're just sitting there asking people what they think, it's not as good as the... Um automatically generated numbers that are just being collected as people go through the cycle without, because then it's, it's just, it's accurate. And it's like, it's not based on what somebody thinks or wants to say. You know, the funny thing is you and I are such, we're still on the same page. I, I tell people the only thing that's consistent about self-reported data is that it's inaccurate. Like yes, yeah, salespeople that <laughs> log calls, they're only going to log the ones that were good. They want to remember, but they don't log everything. Cause it's a waste of their time. And franchise owners are like, they're like bad sales guys that just don't want to do administrative work. I don't mean that in a mean way. They're just, they're busy. They got to do payroll and they're doing everything, right? Especially the young, early franchise owners. So they, they don't have the resources to manually update their CRM tool. But for us, you know, I send a text, it's in the platform, it's already logged. I make a call, it's recorded in the CRM. Like I, usually people save 10% of that wasted sales administration effort. Because again, our platform was built not just for franchisors and franchisees and friend of pros, it was built for the, the operator, not for the executive reporting. Uh, in this, we got great reporting, in fact, better, I'd say more accurate reporting on activity level and sales progression, things like that. But it's because the system auto tracks what's happening for you. So you don't have to then you know do your thing and then go report that you did your thing.
Yeah, that's a really frustrating thing, I think, for a lot of people is I have to work and then I have to type all this stuff in and report on what I did, which seems like I'm doing twice as much work. And then you want me to do more work than I was doing before, but now I'm actually reporting. So I feel like I'm doing four times as much work and I'm frustrated. And mm. so having a system that can just auto collect it uh, just frees you up because, man, it's not really the big fish that eats the small fish now. It's the fast fish that eats the s slow fish. Yeah. And so this allows you to be nimble and fast and react and not overwork your people on things that that aren't going to produce a result in the moment. Yeah. And and if I can add on to that, if you don't mind, the thing the, the most time consuming part of generating revenue is the top of funnel follow up and engagement. Right. So if you think about how do we help create a, a, an explosive growth factor for a business, you look at all of the places where they're spending their time. That's that has a low yield. And then you try to automate or eliminate those things. And then you get them spending all their time in high yield activities. Well, on the sales, on the sales part of the you know business, that's the high yield activity is on the phone or in the customer's home or getting them in the club or whatever it is that that real customer interaction. That's where you want all of your human capital focused, right? But the problem is 80% of our human capital is focused on chasing, following up doing things that aren't hyper productive, but must be done to get to the highly, the high yield activities. So we, we've we tried to, to eliminate the need to waste the time on those low yield activities that are necessary to get the high yield. So we have had a gal, I was at a conference this weekend and she, she told me, Dave, um, and she's only worked with us for three weeks, four weeks, maybe she said, you've created a problem for me. I'm, I, I was supposed to be less busy when, when I rolled out your platform but I'm more busy. And I was like, oh, Jessica, why do you say that? She said, well, uh, I used to have all this stuff that I was doing chasing leads. None of that anymore. But I have so many people booking appointments with me. She has 111 active deals in her pipeline now for a single person. That's a, an insane amount of volume. She's like, I'm not sure what to do about it, man. Like we might have to hire a new person to work, to have the conversations and, and get, you know, get people, you know, reviewing FDDs. And like, she's incredibly busy because we just eliminated like a whole chunk of the work she was doing, but it created scale. Now they have to maybe scale up in a good part of the business, right? Where they can create more revenue. Yeah, that's, uh, I think that's the ideal. <laughs> yeah. No salesperson it, wants to follow up on leads. Like I'd have never met one. It's like, oh, you know what I want to do today? I want to just randomly call people who have not responded to me yet. Like no one likes that. I just imagine like one of those uh, roles from a movie where someone's like, hello, hello, just calling, just following up, just wanted to give you a ring, just checking in, you know, I heard you called. It's like, you know, nobody wants that. And uh, yeah, you feel like you're chasing people that don't want to talk to you. If you could just talk with people who want to talk to you, who are excited, engaged, and want your help to get through the process, that's the ideal. So definitely yeah. having that system. And, you know, and the other thing is, is when I think about it, right in the name, client tether, holding on to those clients, you know, mm -hmm. um, can you walk us through kind of the process that people go through with client tether from, let's just say, initial conversation and engagement to developing that uh, person maybe into a franchisee. And then once that franchisee is in operation and uh, running. Yeah, sure. Yeah, it's unique because we're, as, I, as I'm aware, the only real, well, there's one other, but the only platform that can do both, like the franchise development and then the franchisee deployment in the same platform. But I'll say we're the only ones that do it well. Uh, that, that's a fair statement. Um, <clears throat> so sure, uh, franchise, let's say, uh, and we've got a really open API framework, meaning for those of you who aren't technical nerds, I'll push the glasses up. It, it just means we can receive data from about anywhere, as long as they can put it in a structured format. Uh, we can also receive posts from your website. We can receive emails and parse them. We can even have zap your connections. If I feel like we're all failing if we have to use that, but any type of lead you've got, whether it's digital marketing, web forms, uh, you know, PPC, SEO type stuff, organic or social leads or portal leads or anything can flow right to the platform. So point zero in the process is lead is generated, pushed into our platform. I'm So if I'm the sales guy, I'm at my desk doing something. Lead pops in. I don't have to go to my inbox to see it. It flows into the system. We auto attribute where the lead source is, where it comes from. And then we contextualize because we know the source. We turn on a, 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 a we call them action plans, but like a campaign or a workflow. It will immediately mm -hmm. engage that lead. 
from that lead source because you're going to talk to a Facebook lead very differently than an organic lead. Organic leads, they're they're a gold mine. They're you're going to convert at a better rate than any of your other digital leads. So, uh, so you want to talk to them differently. So if that happens. What's going to happen to the consumer is they're going to get an immediate email with a, hopefully a video from that that person who they would be talking to. Then a text message a minute later, a phone call two minutes after that. The call goes to me. So I'm at my desk working on something. A lead's popped in. I don't even know it yet. That lead's already gotten an email. It's gotten a text message from me. And then my phone will ring. So I pick it up. I can see it's calling from my client tether account. So I, I pick it up and it tells me, hey, Dave, you got a new lead. It's it's uh, Lance Hood. He's in he's in uh, you know Iowa City. Uh, you know, from lead source Facebook, press one to have this call connected. So I'm like, okay, I got an idea of who this guy is. I just press one on my phone and now Lance's phone rings. And uh, when you pick up, it's recording in the CRM. So I don't have to hit the dang log call button. We have a great conversation. Then we start moving through the flow, right? I, I screen you. And if it's a friend dev lead, got to make sure you're at least a legitimate buyer, schedule a follow-up appointment to maybe dive deeper. And then uh, we start moving through the flow. Well, as soon as I set that appointment, I can set that in the account, in the, in the platform. And, this, and as soon as I said it, it's going to push it to my calendar, Google or Microsoft. It's going to automatically send you a confirmation. It's going to follow up the day before, and it's going to follow up an hour before the text message. All that's automated to make sure you show up because getting in contact is key. That's the first milestone. Getting you to show up to the second appointment is key. That's how you keep momentum moving. And then uh, in the meantime, it could be nurturing you with a couple of touches here and there, sharing tips and tricks or things you want, might want to know about the brand. Uh, after that second call, we can maybe send you, you're, you're a hot lead. We can click a button and they'll send you an item 23 and an FDD, right? And an e-signature process for item 23 confirmation receipts. So that's automated. So the, the consumer opens up the confirmation receipt page to, to fill it out and sign it. And they can download the FDD from that page. By the way, I'll riff for a second, if you don't mind on this. Yeah. There are platforms out there that make people sign the item 23 before they get access to the FDD. That's actually illegal. Like, so be careful about that process. I've run into a few people have systems that do that. I'm like, uh, you're actually violating what the item 23 is. <laughs> like they're signing a fake document. That's not valid. So you gotta be careful about stuff like that. So we try to fine tune that process so we get people in the funnel to fill it out and that's where they access it. But um, it makes, it eliminates that minutia, that milestone you've got to work through. I know people still get people that print and sign and scan. You'll lose 50% of your quality candidates because they just they won't go through that process. So make it, make it frictionless at this point, then candidates moving through, everything's great. We, we don't do, you know, if, when you, when you get to the point of signing multi-party agreements, multivariate, you know, signatures, we, we say use DocuSign or whatever signing tool you're using at that point. Um, and then, then they're signed up. You can create a, create a copy of that record and move it into a different workflow for your operations. And now in the internal team can be watching it through, moving it through essentially a Gantt chart, um, Kanban board, monitoring where that person's at in their onboarding flow. Meanwhile, you can then create an account for them in client tether for the unit operations, clone from your ideal you know, model account. Two minutes, three minutes later, there's an active account sitting there that's got that's already set up with all the automations and workflows and pipeline views and templates and everything you want them to have to operate successfully. And that should that'll be done weeks before they actually need to use it because they got to get trained and things, but it takes minutes. Uh, to get a, a fully operational account set up. It'll be just them, their own data set, lockdown so they can't see anything else. You don't have to worry about sales rules, routing rules like you do in, you know, like, like let's say a HubSpot or Salesforce or other CRM tools that are pretty common, Zoho. That's just a big blob of data and they're trying to parse it out using complex territory rules. And if you sneeze on the back end, data bleeds and sometimes you're violating your your uh, your franchise agreement by sharing contacts across territory lines. So ours is not like that at all. So I, I don't know if that helps answer your question. There's a lot more day, day in the life of a franchise owner, proposals, payment process, and QuickBooks online reviews. Like we can handle all that for the unit, but I don't want to riff too long on that, Lance. Did that give you kind of a good idea? Yeah, no, I, 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 I'm just drinking it all in and listening as you explain that. And it makes so much sense. If somebody's asking people to sign an FDD receipt before they've received the FDD, they're signing saying that they've received it and they haven't received it yet. Um, yeah. and, and having to be able to push a button to move to the next step, like you push a button in the system and it sends out stuff. I mean, having it so automated like that is amazing. I assume, um, what you were mentioning there is, is that once you set up a franchisor, they can then set up a new franchisee quickly because this is all pre 
predefined things and it will just generate a new account for that new franchisee. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the predefined things are all set with the franchisor, right? Like you, every brand has a, you know, I've got several painting franchise systems that I work with. You know, our, our founder founded Five Star Painting and then brought in the crew like, like Scott and Chad that are still in Five Star uh, Franchising. They co-founded that together. But he he was, he's was he been in franchising like 27 years or something like that. So uh, he started another painting franchise years later. We work with a bunch of people in home services, personal care, pet care, elderly care, like a bunch of home, like service-oriented brands. But um, the platform was designed for them uh, to operate in. Yeah. And then you have all those tools. Well, yeah. um, so how's now we have operations and everything. Can you just take a minute and talk about the, um, um, what do you say, the um, reporting analytics and things like that so that we can dig into the numbers? Yeah. Part, part of what I feel like we do quite well is we simplify data visualization. It's hard. I mean, a lot of folks, when you're in, when you're in a complex uh, CRM, not for this industry, they they took they took the approach that we chose not to, which is eh, go in and go over here and just make your own reports. Like you got access to everything you want and figure it out. Or pay one of our people two hundred fifty bucks an hour, and then they'll they'll work with you for you know thirty seven hours and send you a big bill, and it'll be pretty much what you need. So uh, and, and instead, we looked at what does everybody need to know, and we built dashboards for people. We built um, I would say probably the best visual pipeline I've seen um, in the industry. So you've got the ability, before you even get to dashboards, you've got a, a visual workflow of like, where, what are all my sales milestones? Who's in each step, you know, dates and, and, and values and, and, uh, and aging reports all in one view. So you can see in your pipelines what's happening with your, with your revenue. And, and also, who, does anybody have, are they have overdue calls? Do they have a call today? Do they have automations running? Like you can, you can visualize and it's color coded to see what's actually happening with your pipeline at a glance and then uh, you can do things from your pipeline click and call like you can do a lot on the dashboarding side we pre-built a whole bunch of dashboards to show people you know revenue and and all sorts of reports they need to see uh the sales cycle conversion you know lead source lead attribution data and then also what's happening in this pipeline so from a from an attrition perspective and i was in a previous company i used to help run a translation company before this and uh, I was going to have to pay like $6,500, $7,000 or so to a consultant to build a report that would show me where in my sales pipeline are people falling off of the bandwagon. It's ridiculous. I was so mad when they gave me that quote. I was like, are you joking me? You're a data company. And they couldn't give me the data because they had five different data tables to try to pull it together. We simplified the data structure for franchising because it's unnecessary. And uh, and now we can, out of, just out of the box, we provide a report that shows how many leads came in and then at every stage how many did you lose how many did you keep and what percentage are moving forward what what you can see it immediately is where are we struggling with our sales process and and then how do i and then you know where to focus your attention to fix it you might not know the answers you might just say after we deliver an fdd we got a 70 percent drop off rate that's not right let me go build an automation now that we can use as we send that fdd to follow up with that candidate and then next month, let's see if that becomes sixty-five percent, sixty percent. And what happens to the end of the the end of the conveyor belt if you're fixing all the drop-off points? Is you just start closing more business. And um, mm -hmm. sometimes it's people. You know, sometimes your people are in the wrong seats and they stink at setting appointments, but they're great closers. So you then you know how to split the process, get a good setter, get a good closer. And man, I've, I've seen a lot of people make serious improvements to their business just seeing the data. Yeah, well, with that visualization, it stands out. And the thing that some people don't think about is is that if you start from the beginning of the funnel and work through it, um, you can increase the amount of people that make it to the end by starting at the beginning and opening everything up. And so does it have an ability to like color flag or something? So like, say, if it's really kind of like what would be considered a non-acceptable number, can it be like have a warning like a, a red or something like that where it's um you it stands out because some people might not know what numbers are good what numbers are bad and have an idea of what's normal it's a great question we don't have like um uh, like a benchmarking or grading type system in there where you could set that threshold uh, mm -hmm. there are some and and it's crazy because it's it varies a little bit by industry like with, even in franchising like what's a great conversion rate i can tell you most mm -hmm. 
data that's out there in the franchising industry is way off. They're like, oh, you know, if you're converting 1% of everybody, you're doing great. I've got people that close 2 or 3% of all their dead leads, rehashing them in our system. So I, I think we can all challenge some of those numbers and look at the overall thresholds differently. But uh, for most brands, what I recommend is they they figure out, let it operate, <clears throat> fine tune it for a little bit, and then see where they start to where do they start to see good conversion rates for like their best their best units, and then they use those as their measuring sticks for for other units so as, with their ops team to say, okay, how do you know when somebody's out of out of a healthy range? You know, yeah, mm -hmm. it's a while to know, but it'll vary by by business. So, but we don't have right. to automatically just kind of preset that and then see a warning flag, but uh, you'll see that in the data. Uh, when you start doing like a comparison of an, a comparative analysis right you'll see it compared to corporate and you'll see it the corporate locations and you'll see it compared to other franchisees and be able to establish those numbers and if if you just feel in your gut that a number isn't uh effective then you can start working on that yeah yeah that's good advice i'm mean, usually if you got corporate stores those tend to be kind of your your model accounts so make sure they are model accounts then you've got a really good measuring stick to use when you're doing like a comparative analysis check check a box here this, these two corporate stores i would compare against these three locations you know these my, my my illinois locations and then they then they'll be able to see how do you compare against the corporate uh, ideal model are you able to visualize the conversion rates of leads by lead source so they can get a good uh, amount of knowing where they're where to put their money oh yeah and if, if anyone's you know when you're listening to this you're all probably going to nod your heads at this statement, but one of the most critical things you got to know is which which bucket I'm, that I'm putting money into is generating better ROI and more money for me. A lot of people they market into the same channels because they hear oh PPC, SEO, Facebook, and you know if I'm a home service guy, you know Angie Leads or Thumbtack or whatever Craftjack, Connects Pros, they start buying these portal leads, but they have no idea sometimes that. They might be spending more money uh, than they're getting back on some of these portal leads, or the ROI is so small that they can't afford to cover. You know, the the key, they can't keep the lights on and over, pay, pay the overhead costs with with those things. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. We and we stratify it differently. We show how many leads came in by source. Then we show how many of them got a quote. Then we show how many of the ones that got a quote close. You kind of got a data parfait to look at, and it tells something really important. That's why we did it this way. You might have a lead source that that has like limitless tire kickers. And I don't mean to pick on anybody. Let's pick a portal. Mm -hmm. Actually, I won't say anyone's name. A, a general general portal lead. And you find that you get down the road far enough that you've had you've consumed your human capital. You've sent out estimators to these places. They've sent let's say you did 40 estimates last month for this lead source and you closed one deal. That was probably a collectively, you know, 80 hours of human capital you wasted to get one deal. Um, you got to know that most people have no idea. They'll just be like, "Well, I I got I made sixteen thousand dollars. I spent eight thousand dollars, so I'm doubling my money. Let's keep going." But what they don't know is all of the data, all the effort that went into getting that sixteen thousand dollars negates the the you know the two what it looks like a two x multiple on that investment. So yeah, you've got to look at that, and you got to look at it a little differently than most people will show you the data. And then you're going to start to realize which ones are truly providing ROI and which ones are not. Right. You know, understanding that time and system per lead, per lead source, and, you know, the salesperson that's talking with them and stuff, all that data allows you to really hone in on their most effective processes. And sometimes you have a leader there that could, um, that could help everybody else in the system. You know, you have lead sources that work and sometimes you may not get enough leads from one individual source, so you're just going to scrape the best ones off the top. Mm. And um, yeah, I, I think all that stuff is is so important. Um, did you did you want to go through and show a brief uh, demo today so people just put their eyes on things? Yeah, happy to. And we'll show. You know, lead follow up is probably the the biggest struggle most businesses have, whether it's franchise, fran dev, unit level operation, or just any business in general. They they struggle with that we find uh but then i'll show you a couple other areas too so you know ongoing you know if i want to if i'm an operations uh system I, or, or a team that needs to engage with a customer do a proposal follow-up uh post sell retention referral uh online reputation all those little pieces that are struggles in the sales flow i'll just kind of walk you through how we help people address all of those so uh i'll just show you just as a setting here 
the the generally speaking leads are going to come in through digital forms right so uh here's a here's a form with some 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 information in it that might push right into the platform uh so i'm going to i'm going to curtail or forego that we'll just start with lance so lance if you would have filled out my form i i would the system would have automatically just triggered what we call an action plan so i'll flip the switch for a second so you guys can kind of see but the system will track where the lead came from so it attributes the lead source and then it contextualizes the follow-up it's not a generic, uh, uh, a generic spray and pray kind of a, approach. It's a separate follow-up plan for your Facebook leads and for your portal leads and from your, your digital leads, et cetera. Now, just by that triggering, my phone's already ringing. You've gotten a text uh, and you've also gotten an email from me with a video uh, of me and a link to schedule time on my calendar. If I answer this phone, the system's going to actually cue me. It'll give me a whisper message that says, hey, Dave, you got a new lead. It's, you know, it's this person from this place. Press one to have the call connected. Now I'm going to forego that call uh, for demo purposes, right? But within 30 seconds, we could be on the phone talking. And interestingly enough, that's not the optimal conversion uh, plan. You really want to have an immediate email with a video message uh, from the person that's going to follow up, something along these lines, right? Simple. You don't want it to be all branded in HTML because that tells people it's not a real email from a real human. It tells you it's from a marketing team. They're humans too, but that's not the point. Uh, inside of the inside of the email, you also want to have a, a link to schedule time. Whether you're using Calendly, you want to use the scheduling tool on our platform, whatever you want to use, use something so they can immediately select their time. Especially millennials and younger, they prefer this to talking to a human. So you want to have a span of automation that covers multiple channels and different engagement strategies because that's you want to be able to accommodate the folks uh, that are filling out your forms. And then you want immediate texting to go out. This is the text that went out. Here's the, the phone call. Now, I didn't, uh, it didn't connect because I didn't press one and answer it. So there's no recording. But even when you call out, the recordings are in the platform. I'm showing you this because most platforms, when you're using them, you have to do the behavior and then you go and log the behavior and you do the behavior and you log the behavior. It's, it's infuriating if you're a sales guy because you're validating your existence for executive reporting and you're wasting about 10 to 20% of your day in sales administrative work. I've never met a good salesperson that likes doing that work uh, in 20 plus years. So uh, my recommendation, th this is an area where we don't talk about a lot, but we generally save people 10 to 15% of, of lost productivity from other platforms. In addition to the immediacy of the engagement and the rapid improvement of, of marketing ROI, we reduce your customer acquisition costs rapidly because you're engaging your leads and in, in getting in touch with them quickly, but also, uh, help help with a lot of other things. So let me show you this nurturing. Uh, most people, uh, the majority, won't answer right away. But if you want to maximize your conversion on your investment in those leads, you need to nurture them. Usually, about thirty three percent more sales will come from this, and it reduces your sales per lead, your cost per lead, your cost per acquisition by about fifty percent by having an effective nurturing program. I don't mean email drips only. Like this needs to be omni-channel. So as you look down below, we've already had a whole bunch of activity go out but there's a whole lot that's still scheduled to happen, right? So there's a, you know, a text going out tomorrow, an email over the weekend, a reminder to give you a call that will still be there on Monday. Uh, that text will be held until Monday. So you can create hours of operation. The system will then operate around that and deliver messaging around your, your hours. So, but the system's gonna nurture you until Tuesday, the 13th of June, almost two full weeks. At which point you'll see here, it says move to the next plan. So we can also automate the connection between plans. So if you're nurturing someone for 14 days, a new lead and they don't engage, well, you don't throw them away. They're not a dead lead. They're just an, an unresponsive lead. So you want to move them into a longer term nurture campaign that you know whatever your typical buying and consideration cycle is, and then when people might re-engage, make it that long, 12 months, 18 months, and give them value-added content. And it'll it'll feed that up uh, or serve that up so that they, they stay engaged and interested and find you as an influencer, someone who's got uh, expertise in the space that they want to buy. I'm going to go ahead and shut that off for now uh, because you don't need me to nurture you, Lance. But let's talk about other things that we do in the platform. You know, we can do immediate texting, right? And, and you know, you're, you're going to get that within about a second when I send it. Or I can grab templates and say, here's a testimonial. And I can schedule delivery of that. Uh, and so rather than just send it right now, it might be 10 o'clock at night and I'm catching up on work. So uh, I'm going to schedule that for, let's say, uh, Monday at, let's say, over the lunch hour or right before the lunch hour. It's a good time to text. And I'll save that. Well, every time, everything I'm doing, you're seeing it in the queue. There's another thing we do differently. We, we provide visibility into the automations in the queue 
and a lot of other platforms, it's like three windows over, two clicks, un- log out, log into new systems. Like it's hard to see. And and we also have automation built in. If you're in a new connection plan with as a new lead, then if that person texts back, the system will automatically shut off the rest of the nurturing because that's a legitimate engagement now. And we want humans to talk to humans. We want to get out of the way. So we also are sensitive to the fact that other automation tools that are kind of rudimentary drips, they'll embarrass you sometimes because you forget to shut them off. And we try to engage and, and do that for you as much as we can. So I'm going to slip out of this though. And, you know, we can do the same thing with the email. We can schedule phone calls. If you're going to be driving to the airport, stuck in traffic for an hour, you can schedule calls. The system will literally call your phone. You pre- you hear the whisper cues, you know who it is, press one, and then their phone rings and it records in the CRM. Uh, we can integrate with a lot of other platforms, Thumbtech, Angie, Sales Chats, a bunch of tools that can augment functionality here. But let's talk about now, the new leads in, the first thing, I, the priority is I want to get them scheduled with an appointment. So inside of the inside of the candidate record, I guess I can, while well, I'm on the phone with them, go to an appointment, book the time, let's say it's the 7th at 11 a.m. It's a 45 minute appointment. And if I say, I want to send them a copy, or I say, no, I actually want to, I want to send them an invite by an external calendar, meaning I want my Outlook or I want my Google or my G Suite to send this invite. You've got a lot of options there. Uh, I'm also going to say, let's let's turn on an automation plan. So when I schedule this appointment, the system will then automatically remind the individual there's an appointment. Maybe a confirmation text will go out now. A, a day before in the morning, it'll remind them. And then two hours before, an hour before the appointment, they get a follow-up text. This is an area you've spent all the time and effort to get the appointment scheduled. And then your show rate isn't always as good as you want it to be. This is how you close that gap. You make sure that at every step in the process, you're using automations to to enforce the process and also give someone a really rich customer experience. So don't overdo it, but yeah, you can you can build that whole thing out. And then I can also look down below and see calendars, right? I can see when, you know, what, what is my availability? Not looking good the next couple of days. Uh, this is actually showing my live Google calendar. We, we're a G Suite shop. So if it's Microsoft that you use, this will display your Outlook calendar as well. But I can then find times that I'm available or if I'm looking for my team members, I can see all of them here as well as I'm booking appointments. Or if your call center team, this is built with call center support, omni-channel support center uh, functionality in the platform. Uh, and so they can actually be, see a local franchise unit availability and book an appointment using the same tools. So uh, very simple. But then it does everything I need to make sure that the appointment holds. So now we have the appointment. I show up on site, my estimator goes, whatever that process is for you. And you show up and, and they want a proposal or a quote. Well, that's all built into the system too. I'll open this up. You can have, you can totally customize the worksheets. This is one that, that we, we we did uh, briefly together, Lance, for like a, a painting of a room. And so I just, all I had to do was plug in the dimensions of the room and it automatically calculated all the paint and everything we needed for walls, trims, and ceiling. And then uh, I put in a couple of inc- incidentals for this, the, the doors and window frames, et cetera. I might add in a sundry cost here. It's a complicated window frame. And you know, my, my, my quote's done, right? So um, now the cool part is it's, it's done in the sense that I can turn this disc around to the consumer while I'm in their home and say, hey, here's, here's everything we quoted. Here's the total. Uh, we've got a busy production schedule. If you'd like to get this going, let's go ahead and get that the deposit check today and I'll have you sign the proposal here. Terms and conditions, e-signature are all built into the platform. Uh, now, let's say, which is typical, they say, eh, I don't know about that. Um, would you send me something to review with my spouse? We need to look at budgets. Uh, typical runaround. You can you can automatically send them an, another action plan, automation sequence that would deliver uh, you know, a high-end looking proposal with uh, sales tools, embedded videos, uh, you know, testimonials, whatever you want this to look like. And then the proposal, the costs, the line items, the totals, and then it would have the terms and conditions, and the e-signature block. So giving them the ability to sign it at home. Now, we also have just rolled out a couple of new triggers. So if they sign this at home, uh, then the system can automatically move them into a new action plan then start to maybe engage them about getting something on the schedule. So uh, there's a lot, there are a lot of cool tools around that in the system today. But let's keep moving. So now that they've, they've got that scheduled, we've, we've got work orders built into the system if you're subbing workout. You can do invoicing. We've got payment processing, QuickBooks Online integration. It's it's all built into the platform. And then, then, but let's take a step back now. Customer journey, you've closed the deal. They've paid. Everybody's happy. 
Well, let's say I want to look at my, my I want to do some bulk engagement. So and within the platform, we also help you know what to do, right? So if I say, who do I call today? When I first log in in the morning, I can click on a green dot. There isn't anyone, but I can look at my overdue tasks, these yellow dots, and it'll show me my to-do list on screen in the context of my contact list. And I can click to dial through my list and the, my phone will ring, press one, I'm on the phone with them, leave a message and it'll delete the, the reminder notice or I go in and clear it out. So it can help you be very efficient as you're managing large groups of contacts or I might wanna engage in bulk. So I might say filter down to everybody who's you know an inactive lead. And I could filter down multiple layers in the state of Florida, et cetera. So I, but then I'll say, okay, I want to take all these folks, select them all. I want to send them a text and let them know about an upcoming event that we've got. So and I'm going to use this template. Let's set a time to meet. 100 people are going to get a text in like a minute because uh, it'll, it'll send them out one at a time. So the, you can do massive re-engagement. You can do promotions for events in the platform for uh, kind of day-to-day -day things. Or I call them, you know, you can resurrect some leads by doing the same thing, go to your old leads, select them all, and then just move them into an action plan. Say, oh, here's my lead rehash campaign, and you're not interested, friend of, and then boom, those people, 100 people now are gonna be in the sequence that might go for the next year, staying in touch with them with value-added content. This is how you resurrect old leads. Now, we talked about proposals and, and managing those. We can create automation sequences that when you've created that proposal, you turn that automation on, it'll send the proposal, follow up with the text, it's happened to me this week, yesterday. I sent somebody a proposal and he said, and he got the text right after that was automated. said, hey, tell me what questions you got. Let me know if you, if you got that proposal. I just sent it to you. He texted me right back, said, hey, did, what email address did you send it to? So I looked at my inbox uh, and I, uh, or in his record, I noticed I had misspelled his email address. So because of that follow-up text, how often does this happen in real life? Like very often you're sending quotes out to the wrong email address or goes to spam or something. And they never see it. And you assume they're not interested. Well, guess what? There's probably a, you know, 20, 30% of all those non-responsive or unresponsive opportunities that are just some deliverability issue where it got buried under a whole bunch of other spam and they never saw it. So that, that follow-up text and then a follow-up email the next day and then a follow-up two days later with another text, a reminder to call them, even automating the follow-up of a proposal can increase your close rates 10 to 20% uh, almost instantly. So Let's move on to the end of life. So I've got a customer and, and I've got them and they just closed a deal. They just paid me. They're happy. I can also move them into automation plans. Let's go into Neelam for a minute. So I can move them into an automation plan that would be a retention plan. So we've got conversions and, and retention. It might be a post-sale referral request. I turn that on. It's going to nurture them for 12 months. It's going to ask, tell them thanks. It's going to then ask them for a, a review online. And we automate that with a, a, to, a tokenized link. Uh, and then, then a week later, it might ask them for a review or a referral to somebody who they know might need this, a similar service. Referral gathering, some clients will give you up to 11 referrals if you keep asking. The problem is you don't ask, and so you don't get them. So you want to keep asking regularly for referrals. Now, now this is all great. You can see the sales automation. I'm sure you know, you're know you excited, as excited as I am about this. But there are other aspects of managing a business that you have to pay attention to. You've got to be able to visualize your pipeline, see where your deals are, see the values, the roll-up the roll up quality or the roll-up values of, of what's in the pipeline. You also want to see aging. I can see in this in this pipeline, I've got people that are aging out. These are new, but as I scroll down the column, I can see I got people 63 days in a column. That's too long. That means it's a dying deal. And I can also use the same tools here to say, well, I'm looking at my pipeline, show me all of my overdue tasks and I can engage those people right here. And also know that I want to work right to left, most important to least important, most urgent to least urgent through my pipeline as I look at my overdue tasks or my calls for today. So it's all kind of integrated into each screen so you can take action and be really productive wherever you're looking. We also let you manage five different contacts and five different pipelines in one account. So I can have, if I'm a franchisor or franchise developer, I can see my franchise candidates. I can even see, let's say, my franchisees. And I can create an onboarding process to show you how I'm moving them through training and onboarding and launch. So that that's all, you know, you can also then put your brokers in as another contact type and engage the broker network. Uh, lots of different applications of that. Uh, dashboarding is, is you know, obviously you, you need to know what's happening. But if I want to look at my prospects for, the last, let's say, the last 90 days, I refresh that report. 
It'll show me if I'm using the proposal system, my revenue, my salesperson close statistics, my milestone comparison periods, my lead flow. This is what you want. You want to see up and to the right, right? That's what at certain times of year it won't be, but I want to see my lead attribution, my progression across the sales flow. This is a chart that was, it would have cost me about 10 grand to build it in Salesforce when I was in a, running another company. Uh, we provide the data to you by default because we structured our data differently. So it'd be more productive for you. Um, but I can see where I'm losing people in my sales funnels. That's critical data most people don't know. They just can see leads in, close rates. And the, the middle middle is a mystery. We try to take the guesswork out for you. And and as I, as I go down, there's a lot more here. I could show you lead conversion by, by, uh, by source. There's all sorts of data, you know, productivity reports, individual contribution reports. But this is one of the most critical data pieces you need to look at, like which lead channels are producing at what rate. So I can also predict future revenue based upon spend. So there, there's a lot in the system there. And one last thing, because I don't want to demo you to death, but multi-unit businesses, so dealerships, networks, uh, you know, uh, franchise systems, our platform was designed for them, where most were not. Meaning out of the box, you can create uh, you can create the structure for your your your, your business model. If you're a multi-location business like a, like a, a, an insurance company, real estate offices, they'll, they'll open up satellites all over. You can create a systematic approach to universally manage engagement and data across the nation. And I just picked a couple of locations randomly, but then I can also then look at their performance across, you know, do a comparative analysis of revenue, uh, salesperson statistics, identify key players and who's not, who's struggling and in specific areas, lead flow across the board, attribution of all franchise locations I just selected. Most franchisors have no idea what's happening under in the black box of the franchise unit. We provide visibility and coaching potential. So I can look at this and say, wow, uh, these guys are doing pretty well. Most of them are converting their digital leads, mostly are paid portal leads like Angie or Thumbtack at a rate of 60% or a little higher. I've got one that's a clear outlier as a franchisor I can now coach off of this data. I know where that person struggles in the process. Incredibly valuable data. Uh, and you get the idea, but I, I don't want to belabor that Lots of data that rolls up because of the architecture of the platform. And uh, Lance, I ho hope that gives you a good idea for the folks that are watching how Client Tether can make a significant impact on your, your business. Well, I know that you're just skimming the, the basic details due to uh, the time constraints, but this is incredible. Anytime that you can look into this data and find what's working, where things are falling off, and you can measure, you can't improve if you're not measuring, and you can just see it. Yeah. And the follow-up is impressive to me. You said that people can save 10 to 15% uh, just by the automation of the follow-up. I'll tell you, uh, that's probably like 30% with me because I'm not as efficient as you at typing all that out. <laughs> After a call, it, you know, I would save a lot more time. Uh, and, and I can tell you, salespeople hate doing all that manual post-call notes and clicking switches and remembering it. Um, even in this, uh, you know, we have, you know, a CRM that is designed just to help us with this. And, uh, I get people going, did you fill that out? And I'm like, no, you know, <laughs> so, so this is, yeah. this is, uh, I'm really, uh, uh, impressed with everything you've done. And I know it's because instead of this being designed to be a software to help salespeople, this was designed by franchisor for a franchise business. So it's all designed for franchises. And that's one of the reasons that it's just everything's thought. And you guys seem to have a commitment to constant improvement, which I love. So I love everything I see here. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Lance. I appreciate that. How long does it take generally to get uh, people switched over and implemented to where it's just working? Like it's just a Tuesday. Yeah. I mean, if you're a friend of team, I mean, let's say four weeks. And that might even mm -hmm. include our team building custom content alongside you uh, as you're deploying and, and training. It's, you know, it's uh, maybe as long as five weeks, but most people, when you roll them out, it's like, oh, five months is about right. That's when we could really use it. And we're, we're I mean, we built it for this industry, so it's extremely fast to deploy. Right. Yeah. Cause that's, you know, you're right. Like I would plan somebody saying it's going to be many months. That just seems so fast. Uh, to transfer data, to train on it, and then to be using it. That's that's pretty, pretty cool. Um, I guess what I was, was going to ask you is I just want to switch and ask you a little more content questions. I know we talked about um, 
lead follow-up. Like that was one of the big things that people have because I mean, sales is oxygen, right? Um, and you were going to go through lead follow-up with lead engagement and follow-up. So I'd love to start by talking about that, Dave. Oh, please. Yeah. Well, tell me what you'd like to know. How can I help you with that? Well, I mean, uh, you as the expert had uh, just had some really good stuff on it. And so I just want to see if we were going to walk people through a process, uh, what would that be? Like what, what best practices and things that you've learned about engagement and conversion when it can't, comes to that? Yeah, let's, let's talk about it. And, and I'll bring up chat GPT because everyone's hot on that topic, but you want to automate what should be automated, right? <clears throat> Uh, there are tools out there. I mean, they're, 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 I respect the heck out of them, but they're tools like Lumen AI and some tools that have tried to automate the whole initial engagement process and then the rest of the sales process with chatbots communicating with people. Talk to a salesperson that uses that. They, they just don't work well. So you want to automate what you should automate. Then you want to, as soon as, as soon as the automation has done its job, in an ideal world, you want to be extremely fast to communicate with the lead. Uh, that's key. Speed to lead has never gone away. It doesn't make people mad. If I feel if I put, take the time to put my personal information in a form because I want to know more about what you got, I expect you to get back to me faster today than I did five years ago. And that 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 time frame is going to continue to get smaller as people are getting instantaneous data everywhere. If, if I have to, you know, you were having internet issues earlier today, I'm tapping my toe if I don't have, you know, 40 megabits per second download speeds, right? It's so just bear in mind that in the world has shifted. There's a there's, a, there's an expectation that you get in touch fast. And also there's an expectation you get in touch in a medium that's going to be useful or helpful for that person. So by age, it changes like younger folks, let's say 35 and younger, you better be texting and, or if you're young, you know, you also want to stay in platform. So if you're doing Facebook lead, lead gen, you want the form to be in Facebook so you can maximize the number of people that convert because they were on that platform in the first place. Don't immediately try to pull them out of platform to get them to a lead form on your website. That's marketing strategy, not sales, but you're going to maximize your lead flow then you want to immediately engage those folks with, with phone calls, with texts, with emails. And uh, the reason why I recommend all three as soon as you can is because different people respond differently to different uh, channels. And so most platforms can automate email drips. Guess what? It's the worst. Uh, it's the lowest conversion rate, lowest engagement rate. You can make it better with video, but you, it's not great. So don't, don't rely upon your your 2003 technology of email drips like that's been around forever and and it felt people's inboxes are cluttered so but use it to support the rest of the process when you synergize let's say i need to send a document follow up with a text after i've sent the email and say hey don't check your inbox i just sent you that quote but a lot of people i can't remember what number like maybe a quarter of all quotes that get sent out just never get read because they went to a spam folder or somebody missed the email but if I send a text two minutes at, two minutes after I send the, the email with the, the link to the proposal, or heck, in our platform, text the proposal link. But you know, if I follow up with that, the likelihood of that the email getting read goes up tremendously. Uh, so in the follow-up process of leads, multi-channel, use nurturing. You have to nurture because you're even as good as our platform is, you're not going to immediately book everyone. Uh, highest conversion rate I've seen across our whole system is like 91% of all leads get scheduled. It's ridiculously high out of thousands and thousands of users. That's the top dog. And a lot of his, and, and there's a long story there, but he's killing it. Uh, for franchise systems that rely upon, um, let's say like Angie Thumbtack, more portals or you know a lot of digital, I see numbers as high as like 65, 75% conversion rate into booked appointments because they're following the, the roadmap, the, the plan of automation, quick to you know, speed to lead and then, then nurturing. So I'd say for lead follow-up, Th those are the key things. If you're not doing those, you're happy to coach you a little bit, even if you're not a client of mine, but you need to fix it because you're wasting money. Right. Yeah. No, I, I, I think that what you said too about the texting, I forget the numbers. Isn't it something like the average text is read within three minutes or something like that? It's incredibly yeah. high and people see their phone. They may not check their email or see their email, but you're te I have not seen a uh, spam folder for text messages. So, um, <laughs> yeah, there, there, there is you know? like uh, Androids have one. I think Apple does too. They're blocked. They call them kind of spam or blocked, but it's very small and they're known offenders. Those are the only people that go in there. So, <clears throat> yeah, it's 90% of all texts read in two minutes, two to three minutes. And mm -hmm. uh, depending on the demographic, that number is even higher, right? You know, between, 
let's say 35 and 15, you know, 15 year old, mm-hmm. every text within five seconds. So, you know, it's just going to, that number is just going to, again, it's going to shrink. Now <clears throat> there's more regulation around texting, right? TCPA, things like that. So um, our platform keeps you compliant, you know, as long as you've got a good opt-in statement, then, you know, everything else is, is pretty much automated on our end. Yeah. Well, I can tell you that that that's a, a, a big deal because I was looking at uh, exploring insurance mm-hmm. and, and uh, I thought I was going to get a call from one person, but I got a call from like seven people that work for that company and, uh, and they were all lighting up my phone and one guy texted me mm-hmm. and I texted him back and he texted me back and I started working with that guy, uh-huh. the guy that didn't call me, didn't blow up my phone, but just texted me because mm-hmm. You know, it worked in my schedule and it wasn't annoying. And so it's like having that, what you say, adding this thing in, you're going to find with each client what works for them. Some people call them right away. They'll respond to the phone call. Some will respond to the text. Some will respond to the email. And I really think it makes sense to stay within platform because you know that they're using that, that it's familiar and they understand how to use it and they're currently using it and all that. Well, very good. What about... um, what do you have uh, for uh, talking to people about um, proposal and quote follow up? Because you know, here we have the leads, but what about proposals and quotes? Because that's where it starts to uh, get real and uh, turn into what is a deal. Yeah, there there are three places. I'm glad you brought that up. Three places in the in the sales process, like the three buckets where people fail the most: franchise, fran dev, doesn't matter. Every 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 sales process, high end systems management software. Same problem. Initial leading conversion is problem number one. It's the biggest one. It's your biggest hole in the bucket where you got money just dumping out of your business. Number two, though, is proposals and quotes. So you just spent all that money and time to get to their house and do a quote. You drove there. Maybe it was a half an hour drive, half an hour back. So an hour of just killed human capital, an hour on site, two hours of invested time in this person, plus all the follow up before to get there. That's an expensive moment for your business. And then your person spends you know, in our platform, three minutes, but it doesn't matter. You build a proposal, more human capital, and you show it to them and they want to look at it. They want to think about it, right? Most businesses, and you can pretend like this is wrong. Most of you will be like, yeah, it's actually kind of true for us too. They don't follow up effectively once they've delivered the quote. They're on to the next shiny object. They've only got one estimator and he's busy all day in, in estimates, you know, driving around doing it quotes. And there isn't a follow-up process. So that's a key drop-off point. We see a lot of businesses that are just losing money that they could easily scoop up and put in their pocket is not following up effectively. So how do you do it? You know, send them a quote. There should be an immediate text within probably within a minute or two of you sending the email or frankly, in our platform, deliver the, the, the proposal via the text as well. Because a lot of people, they just want to tap on that on their phone and look at it uh, while they're in a boardroom meeting and they're bored. That's why they call them boardroom meetings. But anyway, mm-hmm. it, but that that's key. But you want to nurture more than that. You want to have a, an email the next day. Set you, and it's all value touches. It's not. Would you get the quote? Just following up. If you use the word "just" uh, as you're reaching out to your customers, you should shoot yourself because it's like a red flag where people are like, okay, sales guy, he has no value to give. But if every time you touch them, send them an email, send them a text, call them three days later, send them another text four days later, send them an email seven days after, you know, like you, you should have a whole sequence to follow up with a bid. And a quote, and it should probably be, look at your buying cycle. If you say, Dave, people make a decision to replace their roof within three weeks, then you should have a three-week follow-up cycle with, once you've delivered that quote, because you'll know at that point, they've probably decided to go with somebody else. You might even have your first step, if, if you go through that nurturing sequence of the proposal, you should have it pushed to another one that goes into a, hey, if you didn't buy from me, hey, it looks like you're, you might've gone with somebody else uh, you know, let me know if you still need some help. Uh, and that's your next touch in the, the long-term follow-up sequence where you still, for 12 months, nurture them, give them tips, share advice about roof maintenance if you're a roofing company, whatever you're an expert at. That'll help you close more deals and keep them warm, even if they realize they can't afford your services. Then when they are ready, they're not going to Google roofer. They're just going to call you because you were the guy that stayed in touch with them for the last 12 months. Mm-hmm. That makes total sense. And I really, you know, gosh, I know we're running out of time, but I have a couple of questions. Yeah. Um, <laughs> one would be, you know, uh, language is important, right? We we communicate with words. 
And so I was thinking about retaining and engaging with people. Mm-hmm. And not only the processes of that, but what are kind of the words and, and languaging that you've seen? So when you're sending a text, you're sending an email and you're making a phone call, that is all an accumulation of words. What are the, uh, what are the things that are really working to connect with people in general? Yeah, so let's talk about medium appropriate communication. So we've all gotten the text message from like our grandma or, or an aging relative that's like five paragraphs long. That's a text that nobody wants to read businesses tend to violate that rule all the time. There's like this unwritten rule that it should be as short and brief as possible. You're not going to say, hello, Stephen, I have always wanted to meet with you. You're going to be like, hey, Steve, I've wanted to meet with you. Or, hey, Steve, let's set up some time. So the, when you're texting, the tone should be a little more casual and familiar, almost like you're texting one of your, maybe not an old college buddy. We're not going to use frat house or locker room language, but like it's going to be, don't abbreviate everything but make it more familiar, abbreviate words, use contractions, like stuff like that. Uh, make it, and don't say the dang word hello. That's like a marketing word. And as soon as I see an email with hello in front of it, I'm like, delete. Like, I, I know. Uh, so that's a big one. Keep it familiar and, and pleasant and friendly. Uh, emails, you want to have a similar tone, but maybe you can be a little more formal. I, I don't think you need to be. In home services, brand dev, nobody wants to talk to a stiff. So relax. Keep it brief in texts, usually about under 300 characters uh, is my recommendation for all texts. Uh, if you can keep it under 150, even better, your response rate will go up a little, actually, if it's a little shorter and to the point. Um, emails, uh, you want to use video. and But also, you want to use, don't, don't ever say I'm following up. Every message you send, either whether text or email, you should be giving value. So send them something that, let me give you an example. You'll say something like, hey, many of our customers have had questions about how to keep their windows clean after we stop by. Here are two tips you might want to know. Use your old newspapers, use, you know, use Windex, like whatever, right? Like whatever you're an expert at, you want to put your expertise on display every single email without being salesy because people don't want to be pushed. They want to, they want to, they want to pull themselves into the deal. Give them a reason to want to do that by helping them trust you. Right. Answering uh, any objections they might have before they're voiced or come up because if you can answer their objections in a video, then they don't have to hold on to that and get worked up about it. And they also don't have to feel uncomfortable about asking you. So then you you've cleared that out of the way if they've watched that, you know. And and that's a great thing to handle in those follow-up sequences for sure. And and another thing I think is if you teach people something they didn't know that they didn't know, they've now learned something and now they're paying attention to you, especially if whatever they learn is a value to them, you know? Right. Yeah. It's, it's, and you're the expert, right? If you're a roofer, a plumber, whatever, like, you know, a lot of stuff that they don't know. Uh, your, your comment, I was smiling big because I was just training someone this weekend on find that what are the top five objections that people have to buy in your service, the top five fears. And you should have a step that addresses each one of those in your nurturing sequence, because by the time they're done going through those, if they're opening those messages or reading what you send them, they're probably going to increase their likelihood to buy by double digit percentages just because you've eliminated these subconscious fears that they might not have even known they had. But when you service them like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. OK. Oh, there's financing options. Good. I don't have to get a second mortgage on my house right now. Like I can actually afford this. That's I, I, that's really, really smart. I'm glad you said that. Yeah. Well, absolutely. Well, I know we're running out of time, Dave, but I just want to thank you for joining me. And I want to encourage everybody. Um, Go check out the link next to this video and uh, reach out to Dave at Client Tether and uh, see where that goes because you know it, it just seems like it's it's really very automated and uh, when we've talked behind the scenes and here um, you're always learning and it seems like you're putting what you learn into the program to simplify it because some people as they continue to evolve and improve they add on to versus condense and simplify with new functionality. So you don't want to make something so big and cumbersome. You have the Titanic that can't do anything, but as you want to make it better and more intuitive and simple so that people can actually work, you know, yeah, thank and use you. it. I appreciate it. We, that's, we, we spent a lot of time. We listened to the market. I wish I could say we were the geniuses, but the geniuses that drive a lot of our innovation are you guys, the people that use the platform say, hey, what if, what if, and we love that. But, always in the back of our minds, okay, but how do we make it usable, right? How do we make that simple? How do we make it so 
95% of all franchisees could deploy that resource and not, not get lost. Like it, it's, it's tough, honestly, balancing those things, but thanks for uh, the shout out on that. Cause it, it, we've been working hard at that. Absolutely. Thank you, Dave. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Lance.